Dear God, in this moment, in the wake of this beauty, help us find our way to the heart of another story that is about a stranger who should be known. Amen. So uh, the book of Esther <clears throat> that I talked about a little bit um, in the children's time shows up in the lectionary every three years, and, and I preached it in all but one or two of the churches I've served over my long time pastoring. And in every sermon up till now, I've focused <clears throat> exclusively on the person of, of Esther, who becomes a queen, as she responds to the crisis that she finds herself in, the part of the story where an older cousin of hers, who was also her guardian, it's kind of complicated here, named Mordecai, sends words, word to her, alerting her uh, to a secret Persian plot, there are Jews living in Persia, um, to kill all the Jews in the city of Susa where they live. He tells her she needs to go to her husband, the king, uh, and let him know of the murderous plot that his first minister named Haman, remember the proud guy I talked about in the kids' time, uh, the, the plot that Haman has hatched, hoping that she'll put a stop to it. Well, Esther messages him back, saying, please find somebody else. She adds that she'd rather ride under the king's radar, remain a quiet, passive consort, Intervening this way would just mean she'd probably be dead. This is where Mordecai writes her letter back saying, and we had it in the scripture today, don't imagine that because you are part of the king's household now, you'll be the one Jew who will escape this genocide. If you keep quiet at this time, liberation and protection for the Jews will appear from another source. And while you and your father's household will perish, it may very well be that you have achieved royal status for such a time as this. Well, it's a fascinating exchange. However, looking closely at the story this time around, uh, another personage in the text is tugging at me. And I'm speaking of Esther's predecessor, the queen that Esther replaces, and her name is Vashti, Vashti. Now, Vashti disappears from the narrative by the end of chapter one of this book. And here's how that happens. The king, his name is Ahasuerus, has one queen, but he has a vast array of concubines. And he sends for them according to whatever whim drives him of a given evening. Well, when his whim eventually settles on Queen Vashti, this is before Esther shows up, she sends word back that she'd rather sleep in her own bed in, the, in her wing of the palace. Fact is, she draws a line in the Persian sand. She makes a conscious decision for a reason that is not stated to say, no, not tonight. Knowing full well that it can lead to a ton of trouble for her, and in fact, it leads to her banishment. At least she gets to keep her head, right? Anyway, a conventional reading of the story sees Vashti only as a plot device meant to set up the rest of the narrative in which Esther, a Jewish girl, not a Persian, like Vashti, who's a Persian, in which Esther gets the starring role. <clears throat> and look, I mean, this is a fictional tale. It doesn't pretend to be history. Like any folk tale, most of the characters are, are in fact merely two-dimensional. The king, for instance, is a stock type of king. He's selfish, pleasure-driven, self-indulgent, simple-minded, easily manipulated by his evil first minister, Haman. To see Vashti as a, a willful, easily dismissible lever for this story is acceptable if one kind of skims the story thinking it's only a folktale. Jewish congregations, in fact, the world over, read a short version of this story aloud every year during the festival of Purim. And when the name Haman, the king's evil counselor, is read, they, they hiss and boo loudly. 
It's part of the festival's color of a festival in which they celebrate coming through pogroms and genocides they've endured for generations. The story notes that they have survived as a people by their wits and by the skin of their collective teeth. Well, reading the story closely this time, Bashti, <clears throat> Bashti, the first queen, will not leave me alone. As I said earlier, by chapter two, she's gone. But it's clear that she casts a very long shadow over the whole book. What occurred to me this week is that to dismiss her as the perfect foil for Esther is not just unkind, it's inaccurate. It's a disservice, in fact, to women everywhere. I mean, to see Vashti as a kind of diva and Esther as merely passive and submissive, the perfect king's wife, is to be complicit in every bad thing that men have ever inflicted on women since the beginning of time. Now, if you don't remember the basic storyline or if you've never heard it, here's how it starts. Vashti is the queen of Persia. She refuses to go to the king's chambers when summoned. The king's first minister, Haman, says, get rid of her. We'll find you a new queen. Vashti is banished, and an IQ test is given to all the women in the kingdom to identify the smartest one among them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, you guessed it. They have a beauty contest. <laughs> Miss Universe. Inviting women from all over the kingdom to apply. They set up a runway, and Esther, a di diaspora Jew who hides her ethnicity, is chosen based on her looks alone. You see what kind of a man's world we're dealing with here. So that being the background of the story, how does one preach this without throwing Vashti under the bus? Well, I think you do this by asking some important questions. You give Vashti her due. You at least ask the question, what has led her to say a flat no to the king's summon? summons? Excuse me. Did something happen during a previous encounter with that king? Did she finally wake up and say, a woman's life has to amount to more than this, right? Or being a queen has to amount to more this, more than this? In, in any case, we need to wake up and admit that when Vashti chooses to not go to her husband, who's the king, she's putting her fragile life on the line. What I'm trying to get at here is that Esther is not the only person in the story to have an existential crisis and say those words, if I perish, I perish. Remember how that played out? Esther's cousin Mordecai said, you got to go to the king, see if he loves you enough to stop the evil plot of Haman to murder all the Jews in the empire. Esther says, no, first, find somebody more suitable. Then when he says, our only hope is in you, she decides to put caution aside and takes the risk of walking unsummoned into the royal presence, which she knows can seem very presumptuous and lead to her execution. Well, Queen Vashti did the same thing when whatever was eating her up inside made her say to the king, no, or not tonight, or never again. Now, the upshot of her refusal is more than her banishment. Vashti's refusal sets, uh, sends shockwaves through the whole empire. This is an interesting part of this. If the king's wife, you see, dares say no to him, well, what will the wives of common Persian men say to their husbands? By the final verse of chapter 1, an alert is sent to all King Azuharis' subjects, reminding them in no uncertain terms that, quote, every man must rule in his household. Rule. See what's at stake here? This is a very old folktale. It's mostly told as entertainment. 
But you know, the same struggle we see fictionalized here in the book of Esther, written in the second or third century BCE, is happening in this country in 2024, and it's on every ballot this election season. Voters are making decisions that will answer the following questions, right? Do women exist only to please men? Should women have any say in the control of their own bodies? If not, who should have that authority? Well, let me note that genocide is central to the narrative of Esther. But the subtext about women and their bodies cannot be ignored. Not now, not this year, never again. So let's look at the basics of the story. What we know about Vashti is this. Like her successor, Esther, she is very beautiful. Unlike her successor, she seems to have a mind of her own. And finally, we know that she knows how to plan a really good party. Hold that thought. It's going to be important later on. Here's what we know about Esther as the story opens. On the face of it, she appears to be the perfect king's wife, at least by Persian standards. Totally submissive. The reflexive use of the Hebrew word lakach is constantly applied to her. She is lakach. She is taken. That's the word. She is taken in by Mordecai as a foster daughter. She is taken to the king's harem. And she is taken before the king. She is not her own person, at least as the story opens up. On top of that, Mordecai commands her not to reveal her ethnic identity at the palace. She requests nothing at the harem, only accepting whatever the king's eunuch chooses to give her. Even after she's crowned queen, we're told that Esther continues to obey the commands of her guardian Mordecai as she's done all the time since she was an adolescent. It's no surprise that King Ahasuerus approves of Esther. She is the model of docility. He obviously sees her as the perfect antidote to Vashti. But the crisis that arises in the realm when Mordecai reveals the genocidal plot to Esther is where everything in the story turns. She's caught between conflicting obediences she will choose to, will, will she choose to obey her guardian, Mordecai, or her husband, the king? Big question. In this moment of crisis, Esther looks into her mirror and discovers that she does not look very different from Vashti after all. A cursory reading, though, might surmise that she sides with her guardian, but that's not exactly true. As things play out, we see that Esther takes matters into her own hands, and what does she choose to do? She decides to stand up to both sources of male authority. If you look at the story closely, you'll see that Esther assumes control of Mordecai's plan to save the Jews. In crucial ways, she changes and amends his plan as she sees fit. She makes it her own. Like Vashti, she'll appear before the king only when she decides that the time is right. In this case, after three days of fasting, instead of following Mordecai's suggestion to simply show up in the king's court and make her petition, she decides to throw a series of small dinner parties as Vashti had done when she was queen. So, ironically, in order to succeed... Esther takes on aspects of her predecessor, the reputed, excuse me, repudiated former queen. And as she goes about concocting a plan to save her people, she borrows tactics from her. However, it's clear that Esther is more calculated and more subtle than Vashti. In fact, she out Vashti's her, which is a a delicious touch in the story for those who read it on its own terms. She takes her time and charms the king and his minister Haman, kind of like a Mata Hari. For a reader to dismiss Vashti's crucial importance to the story is to miss her abiding presence throughout the rest of the book. Her spirit and example is a key to Esther's maturing and transformation. It reminds me of the fact that a huge part of our maturation has to do with 
modeling ourselves after others, those special people we are drawn to, especially when we're young, personal heroes who help us explore and challenge our own personal boundaries. You know, when we're young, we all dress up as other people. Sometimes that's a good thing. Other times, if we choose lousy models, it's a disaster. Unfortunately, we are living in a moment when many people, in the name of Jesus, in fact, are imitating people who have questionable character, people with faulty moral foundations. It's pretty mind-boggling. If a person has strong traditional conservative instincts, there are many excellent examples to model oneself after. In a recent sermon, I mentioned John McCain as one of them. Mitt Romney is another. Liz Cheney is one I never would have considered until recently, but she has an amazing spine and abiding values too. She's kind of like Vashti. We may discover, as Esther did, that the most important lessons can be learned from the unlikeliest teachers. Esther didn't allow the fact that Vashti was banished to keep her from aspiring to have Vashti's great backbone. I guess the virtue I'm lifting up here is a thing called moral courage. A couple of months ago, I wrote a pastor's blurb about a young martyr named Rachel Corey. Rachel was the 25-year-old woman from Olympia, Washington, who in 2003, single-handedly tried to save a Palestinian families from being bulldozed by the Israeli military in the West Bank. Wearing a fluorescent orange jacket, she was killed on the spot by a tractor doing demolition. So when I was pastor at the Ashland Church, we hosted her parents. I said in my blurb uh, just last month that I would soon tell you a story of that visit and, and their abiding love for their daughter. Now, I happen to be uh, the father of a very spirited and principled daughter. I spent most of the week with her this week. So it was sobering for me to hear Rachel's parents honor their daughter's courage way back in 2005, I think it was. The thing that hit me the hardest was when her mother told us that when she was raising her three very tiny daughters, she had planned to keep a diary so that she could write down some of the amazing things they said every day. But here's the rub. She didn't have the energy to do that with any regularity. She said that parenting was so exhausting that she often fell asleep before they did. That's just the way it is for moms and Dad sometimes, right? Anyway, one morning, Rachel, Rachel Corey, age two, said something her mother just had to write down in her journal. She said, Mama, is brave part of growing up? Age two. There it is. Sometimes that kind of thing just appears in a child from the very beginning. It's just there. Maybe Vashti was a Rachel Corey. Maybe being courageous just came naturally to her. Well, it didn't come naturally to Esther, but she had a Vashti to inspire and teach her. In life, we explore and challenge our boundaries, right? If we're healthy, it goes on our whole life long. So let me encourage us all to re-examine whom we emulate and from whom we shy away. What am I saying here? Well, if you think you aren't cut out to stand up to tyranny, racism, child abuse, misogyny, misogyny, the story of Esther says, think again. Think again. Esther's story also reminds us that the struggle women have over who controls their bodies has been going on a very long time, and that battle has not been won yet. The war is currently in a pitched battle. The women's revolution is still in its infant stage. So let me ask, what, 
are you doing to further the cause? Let me put it another way. What are you saying to the children in your circle about this struggle? Your children or your grandchildren? Your nieces and nephews? Are you behaving as if the success or failure of it is up to you in some large or small or even tiny way? I hope so. It's the cause of our lifetime. In his June 1965 commencement address at Oberlin College, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recounted the American folktale Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle, who was asleep for 20 years and slept through the entire American Revolutionary War. Dr. King stated, quote, there are all too many people who in some great period of social change fail to achieve the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands. There's nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. Three years later, at our National Cathedral in Washington, Dr. King elaborated further on this. He said, one of the great liabilities of history is that all too many people fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. Every society has its protectors of status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. Today, our very survival depends on us staying awake to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of the day. Well, today the need is for people to stay awake in order to face down the reactionaries who want to take us back a century or two, people who want misogyny to be normalized and codified. Are you waking or sleeping? Don't forget, Esther first said, who am I to stand up to evil? But later on, when the spirit of her predecessor Vashti wouldn't let her rest, she revised her answer and said, who am I not to stand up and speak my mind? Thanks be to God.